Hey guys, welcome to Talking Strongman. Today's guest is someone that's kind of a staple with Strongman, particularly the Giants Live these days. Radzi Chinyanganya, you are a legend in not just the Strongman world, the, the presenting world. You've, you've been on Gladiators, you've been on Ninja Warrior, a Blue Peter presenter, you presented the Olympics. And obviously, you know, I know you very well through the Strongman world, through the Giants Live shows. It's a pleasure to have you on, my friend. Mate, thank you. I listen to your podcast. I listen to all the episodes, so it's awesome to be on. It's good to have you on. I'm glad you listened to them. Um, I, well, we, we speak at, at comps quite a bit, and you know, you're always, you, you always tell me you watch the show, so it's it's a it's an absolute honour to have you on, mate. I've seen you doing your own um, podcast now, which is is pretty cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, called Making Gains, and it's just about actually it was partly inspired by yourself, mate. Where I've been talking about it for so long, and um, it's I've got a passion for strength, speed, power, endurance people that kind of dedicate their lives to specific things. And I thought, you know, I'd, love, I'd like to find out what makes them tick, find out ultimately what you can learn from them. And so whether it's someone like yourself, somebody like Eddie Hall, somebody like a Usain Bolt, Mark Henry, whoever it might be, people that are truly obsessed slash dedicated to one task. It's a really simple task. It might only take up 15 years of your life, but that I just find fascinating. So that's what it's all about. That, that mindset that people have when they, when they dedicate their life to something. It is, I think, um, at the start of lockdown, I watched the um, Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix. Yeah. And th that guy's determination to, and, and drive to be the best. And you, you see it in, there's, there's a lot of athletes that impress me, but there's very few that have that kind of ridiculous will to win. And, and there, there are exceptions. Like, and someone like Eddie Hall kind of comes into that category. It kind of comes to the camera, isn't I think you can, you can actually almost feel it. When you see Bill Kazmaier underneath the Smith machine, I'm not sure what worlds it would have been now, possibly 81 maybe, but when you've got a close-up of his eyes protruding and you think, oh, this is just, this is different gravy. Or the same when he goes for the bench press world record. And again, they've got this beautiful top shot and he's recently, I think he ruptured his tricep and so that the bar's slightly skewed. And again, they push in and you just see his neck and these eyes and you think, that is a man <laughs> who really wants to lift that bar up. And it's, like you say, they're obsessed. And whether it is a Michael Jordan or to be honest, someone like Lasher, you know, someone of, of, of his caliber, you can feel it when they just got that something extra. And, and Eddie's definitely one of those guys. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's been a number of, of incredible athletes. And you, you, you're showing your strongman knowledge there already, talking about the 81. When did you get, you know, fascinated with strongman? Because as long as I've known you, you're not... You know, you're not someone who they've gone, oh, let's get this presenter to do it. You are a genuine strongman fan. And that's something I want to get across because like Rad Radzi is a huge strongman fan from for, for many, many years. For me, it was what cemented it was the back end of Maggie there. And then towards the Magnus Samuels, Yanni Verton and Sven Carlson's there was just something magical about seeing those guys. And it was, it's larger than life. And I, I've always loved wrestling. I've always loved, I mean, my memories of Linford Christie, for example, Barcelona 92, the 100 meter sprinter. Again, a shot of him, just whites of his eyes. When he'd win, his lycra came down. He looked incredible. I loved gladiators. And so it was just a real sense of these guys are mythical. Yeah. And, and it's, I, Personally, I think the, the strong one that I really love that just gets me is sort of a Mark Felix-esque Hercules hold, where you think, what am I looking at? Or it's seeing you carry a car very, very quickly. Because <laughs> as a six-year-old, you see sort of Grecian pillars falling like that, and you just think, how's he doing that? Or a man running with a car, how has that happened? And so rather than, let's say, a traditional bar with, I mean, I love powerlifting, I love Olympic lifting, but in terms of why I love Strongman, it, it's that. And there was one image, I'm good, I might be wrong here, but I'm going to go with Sun City, maybe, of Maggie there, and it's overhead, and they've got these kind of stone weights. And it, again, it just, it just, I don't know what it was about that I thought, I love this. And so it started then, and then the best part of 20 years on, we're still here. It's amazing. Like, these are all kind of vivid memories that I, I had as a, as a youngster as well. I'm a little, I think I'm just a, a couple of years older than yourself. Look a lot older, but you, you've got the, <laughs> the fountain of youth going on there. But um, yeah, the, these are vivid memories of my childhood. Not, not just a strong man, but you talk about Linford Christie there, uh, 92 Olympics, things like that. Um, just inspiring young kids. 
And I remember watching World's Strongest Man. And the reason I've been fascinated by strength for, for all these years was actually the, the Flintstone lift is one of those lifts that uh, they did it on a deadlift and a behind the neck jerk. And it's just right. visually, I still remember it so clearly. That and the truck pull, actually. The, the truck pull okay. was always kind of impressive to, to, I think it is. It's that one that if people don't train and then, you know, you, you meet someone down down the pub or whatever, and they're like, what can you bench? It's like, well, I pulled an aeroplane or I've pulled a, a <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's that's pretty cool. Or you tell them you flipped a car. That's another really cool event, I think, as a, as a strong man to do. It's I, what I used to love, especially about anything truck pull related, is anyone with a good peak on their bicep. So like Yuko Ahola, 97, when he's there and you just think, oh my goodness, this guy could almost be a bodybuilder with those arms. And yeah, I mean, there's so much to it where it's the, the what happens beforehand. So you're, you're about to pull something, which we, sh well, I say we, you should not be pulling. You've then got the, the actual motion of how they start. You've got the technique, who goes slightly lower, who goes higher. And then what it also used to fascinate me was the footwear choice. Because at one stage, you'd see a lot of climbing shoes, for example. And then it depends on if you're, say, like it was um, uh, in Zambia, when they're pulling the train, you perhaps have something to physically hold on to, or sometimes you don't. Somewhere to put your feet, sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's on, a, say, a, a plain runway. And those micro decisions have a massive impact. And that tells the story. And again, so it's not just biggest man wins. There's so much to it. I think that's one of the great things with Strongman. It's that variety. You can have essentially the same of a set of events from one contest to the next, but with different equipment, different surroundings. And, and suddenly the results change because of that. Yeah. It's, it's not like a, a powerlifting contest where it's always, you know, the squat bench deadlift, it's always the same lifts. And as much as I love powerlifting, I love weightlifting. I think the, the variety in strongman is important. And it's some people, they want that standardization across every comp. I kind of like that it varies and they use, local kind of you know you, you go to africa and and, and do stuff in the outback so you'll go somewhere else and then you, you're on a like you say a runway in an airport or something like that and it's it's using these different locations to challenge the athletes yeah it's it's something i'm slightly torn on because so on the what i think there's a big question really within strongman that has grown so much so is it a sport or is it entertainment and the reason for me that's important is it then comes down to things like world records. So we saw Lasher, for example, a couple of days ago, get world record snatch, European record, clean and jerk. Well, three weeks before then, he'd beaten both of those in the gym. Yeah. Well, under International Weightlifting Federation, it says it has to be a continental event for it to be a record. So that would include Worlds and Olympics. So he could, he could snatch 300 in his gym, it doesn't count. But at the same time, if I ask most of my mates, did you see Lash? I don't even know who he is. Yeah. And so you've then got this, if you like, dichotomy between, right, I would love people to talk about the thing. I would love there to be a spectacle. I'd love there to be an event. But at the same time, I'd love there to be something that says, no, this is what defines it. Same with um, the 100 meters. It has to be a ratified event under the IAAF to be a specifically qualified event to run a world record. I can't just go to Aldersley Stadium, Wolverhampton and run 957 and go, boom, fastest man on the planet. But at the same time, athletics isn't spoken about as much as it should be. In a diamond league, people don't really talk about it. Yeah. So that's why I'm torn, because I really feel that I flipping loved seeing Thor pull 501. And on the other hand, I go, well, there is this big debate. Is it the world record? Is it not the world record? And you think, well, one way of putting it to bed is by making it a sport, but then we're not going to see the Flintstone lift. So <laughs> swings and roundabouts. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a great point. And it's going to be something that is going to be debated for years. It's, I, Thor's lift was mightily impressive. And I think in the, the situation that we were in, he wanted to attempt a record, whether whether it's official or not. The fact is, it was weighed, so we know the weight's the weight. Yes. It was under strict conditions, as strict as I've seen in any contest, and he pulled it very, very well. Now, the other part of me, I always like to see who is the best on the day right. with the best guys. That's why, for myself as an athlete, it's been more about winning titles than breaking records. And I, I've been lucky enough to break a few records, but winning titles was always more important. 
I think we're seeing a slight shift, particularly with the, the younger athletes coming through, where records have become more important. Yeah. You look back at the, um, the contest we watched as kids, no one really spoke about records back then. It was all about winning the world's strongest man, winning different shows. Whereas now we have individual events. So we have like at the Giants Live this year, we've got the Axel world record at the Royal Albert Hall. We've yeah. got the deadlift up in Manchester. And there, there's guys that now specifically focus on one event. And I, I don't know how, I, I, I'm a little bit torn about, I don't know how you feel about it because I like to see the most complete strength athletes. It's it's great to give more people an opportunity, but how many guys are great at deadlifting, but yet they're not great strongman, strongmen? So I actually like the element of specialization just in that it's then, there are so many guys who were outside top three in worlds because they, but would have had one thing that they're amazing at. And you think, well, I wonder how amazing they could have been at that thing. And so you're kind of taking the strong man apart to then discover who's got the world's strongest shoulders, who's got the world's strongest legs. And that also fascinates me. Um, I suppose it's more about the fact of them. So when I saw you at say, uh, Wuss, the first one, I mean, unbelievable in the axle. If anyone hasn't seen you, uh, axle, um, yoke, when you, when you run, but you're basically running mate, it was, it was preposterous. It was a bit like when you're at a sports day and there's somebody that trains and, so, and, and no one else does. And you go, but why is he 20 meters ahead of everyone else? Mate, that's what it was. It was just colossal. So in that, I'd love to know how much faster could you have gone or how heavy could you go to maintain that same, that is of real fascination. Um, but I would, yeah, on the other end of the spectrum is that what discerns a world record? And I'm sure if we changed that implement slightly, let's say the, the legs or the foundation was thinner, it might make it easier for you to run. So wh at what point do we say, well, he actually didn't beat Loz's world record because Loz is... So I think that's one of the issues with a number of strongman events. I think like on a barbell, it's, it's fine. But even then, you know, you compare the barbells now that are used to the barbells 20 30 years ago there is differences so right. it's I, I, it's always going to be a, you know people will look back i'd i'd look love to see what someone like herrick badenhorst could have deadlifted if it was just a, focusing on deadlift because that right. guy was he was way ahead of his time in terms of you know particularly back and leg strength in the, the sort of 90s and, and early 2000s he incredible deadlifter someone like that it would have been cool to see in a deadlift world championships even a Mark Felix, you know, because I remember back in the day, and I'm talking kind of very early noughties here, when I think it's in America, I think it's in New York, they, they put 405 on the bar. And at that time, that was, well, no one's going to pull it. And I think from memory, I might be wrong, but Kevin Lee pulls it and Mark pulls it, or if not, he's very close. And you think, I mean, how is he 20 years ago? He was pulling those numbers and he still is now. But again, I would just be really curious with somebody like Mark. I guess we're seeing it with uh, his Hercules holds. But you think, right, if he's doing that at 54 years old, what would it have been like 20 years ago doing that? And so, and again, this is the side of strongman that it's awesome because how many sports can you have these kind of conversations with of in football? You wouldn't really say who could hit the best free kick if they only trained for the free kick. Yeah. But in strongman, you can. No, they, they can. And, and we've, we've spoken about there's a number of Giants live coming up. Um, tell me what you're looking forward to this year then. We've got a couple of specialised events coming up. Are there any kind of full shows that you're looking forward to? Uh, any certain records that you think this year there's a good chance they're going to get broken? So the, I'm gutted that I probably won't be at the Royal Albert Hall. A, because we get to see the return of the big man. Um, also, and the thing is, Lars, I know that if you're returning, but like I know you said you've played it very cool and you said, you know, it's just about if I get injured, so be it. I'll just see what I've got. We all know that if you're turning up there, you're not there to just make up numbers. So I'm very excited to see you back, mate. Um, but so it's that as a spectacle. And I think it's going to be so cool just to see it, specifically to see Bibi, because 
Bibby is the only, he's one of a kind just in his character, in how just, if you met him, shrunk him down to maybe my weight, you think he doesn't, he doesn't have what it takes to lift those numbers. There's no mean streak in him. But then he's when you- such a lovely guy, isn't he? Such a lovely guy, just, isn't it? just a wonderful human being. But to see him, potentially get the Axel Press world record. Oh, I'd love that. I'd absolutely love it. And I, my guess is as well with him, if he's going to come to the UK, I think he's going to do something ridiculous, especially if he doesn't do anything else in the show, if he just focuses solely on that. I am convinced he's coming just for that record. What do you think he's going to go for? If he can clean it, he'll press it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I, I could see him doing 230. Do you think with an event like that, if it's log, if a guy goes for, okay, let's say Luke Stoltman, if he were to go for the world record, I don't think there's any way he's going to chuck an extra 15 kilos on afterwards and have a pop. No. Does, does the same apply to something like the axe or where if you've gone for it, it's what it's, if you get it, you're done. You can't go again. The, the, the real issue with the axle is how much energy that is taken out of you on the clean getting the, the weight from the floor to the shoulders, because you, you get this, you know, people talk about um, Lasher, for instance, coming over to Strongman and smashing the log and the deadlift, uh, the um, axle. I think with some specific training, he would be extremely good, but there's no way he just steps in and breaks the world records. Right. As good as he is on a barbell, a barbell rotates in your hand. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 particularly a weightlifting barbell, it's designed to be cleaned. An axle is a dead weight. It, it, it doesn't rotate. It's a fixed handle. So as, as the, you clean the weight, the bar, the, the, the wheels on the end rotate. That throws you back. And it's very, very off-putting. It, it really puts a lot of people off. And the, the challenge we've seen over the years with the axle is not the press. It's getting the weight from the floor up to the shoulders. And that's where once it gets up to even 180, 190 kilos, it becomes extremely challenging for a lot of the guys. Now, Bibby has a great grip. Yeah. He's got tremendous power, tremendous leg power. He, he, if you watch his deadlift, he's not so good at his lockout, but he has tremendous speed off the floor. That will help him on the axle because he can really generate speed from the floor to get the, the, the axle up. He's massive as well right now. So he's got like, you know, the, the midsection to rest the weight on. And we've, we've seen how big his arms and legs are. They're just ridiculous. I'm convinced if he gets into a shoulder position, into a rack position, I, I can't put a, a limit on what he's capable of. I mean, we've seen these numbers he's hitting in the gym. I, I, I'd like to see him on calibrated plates. Right. Because, but regardless of that, and this is not me putting, you know, Bibby down. He's, he's using plates that are, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. They're, they're hard to tell. He, I think he claimed like a 260 or something like that. It was something crazy. Let's say it's 240 or even taking 20 kilos off. That's still a ridiculous weight. You know, yeah. it's still more than the world record on the axle. So I'm convinced he's going to smash the record. It's just by how much is going to be the question. I think his 216 is Eddie Hall's current record. So I am, um, my big thing with Bibi, I think there's one other big question mark. And it's because his chest is just so monstrous, he has to get the bar even higher. And he sometimes almost usurps that by then having to lean back. And there have been a couple of occasions when I saw him in Giants, I thought his back's gonna break, his back's gonna break. And so I'd be really curious to know if he's made any adaptations to that. But I'm, I'm just gonna put it out there. I just honestly think that he, it's a privilege to see somebody like that. I mean, if he decided to commit himself to, if you like, full-time strongman training to become the world's strongest man at a world's strongest man event, I personally think he wins. I think his, his biggest current issue is conditioning. But yeah, I just, it's partly some bias. I'm just really like the guy, but yes, yeah, so it's- you can't, it, not, you can't not like him. If anyone's met him, he's just such a lovely guy. Uh, I, and quite honestly, I mean, we talk about great presses. You've got Luke Stoltman in the mix, yes. Graham Hicks. You add, add Eddie and Zadrunas into that mix. I still think Iron Bibby has the strongest shoulders I've ever seen out of anyone. Wow, okay. I, I, I would rate him as number one when it comes to pure strength and just, just kind of, 
you know, not he doesn't have the finesse. He doesn't have the technique of like a Graham Hicks is extremely efficient lifter with incredibly strong shoulders, incredibly strong triceps. Same with Eddie. Same with um, with Zadrunas. As strong as Zadrunas was in the overhead movements, he was still very technically efficient. Bibby isn't technically efficient. And he can still, he's still strong enough, regardless of that kind of, you know, he's not bad by any means, but he's not as good as those guys when it comes to, you know, the, the movement patterns. But regardless of that, he's still more than capable of breaking the records. Yeah, and that's what I find so exciting. And I, so for me, it's that, and it's another event, I'm not sure if he's focusing on, which will be log. Um, because last year was a little bit of a damp squib in terms of there was so much build into 2020 and then we know what happened but Stoltman, Hicksy, again Bibby, who's going to come out on top there? Will they manage to break the world record? And you know we saw how close Luke was in feats of strength. We saw, I mean Hicksy, was it 220 he got in 228 Europe's, Europe's. Europe's was that. Yeah. So but then he was he was cold and you think how much just from a move the actual lift to one side, but how much of a difference that makes when you're cold going into a lift, being outdoors, it's totally different to being in a nice ventilated room that's of a, of a room temperature. So, or an arena, not a room. And so yeah, that I find that's really interesting. And it was what, what I loved most about Luke's failure was what he put on Instagram about 24 hours later, where you could just see he was devastated. And I thought, Somebody who says, I gave it everything, it just wasn't to be, that would say to me, you didn't actually believe it. I thought he was gutted because he, know, he knew and knows it's there. And then the crazy thing is, I think he's got even stronger. So, you know, him and his brother, I mean, just, I mean, uh, <laughs> Tom, uh, it's just, when you see the, this footage I saw of Tom in the crowd watching his brother at one of the Giants events, it's a different blank. It's just, a, it's a boy versus whatever. Tom's no longer a man. He's beyond man. He's super <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, their progression, mate, is just, it's frightening. The standard in the UK right now is quite frightening. When you, when you think of the great strong men that we've had, and they're still competing as well, uh, but the new breed of athletes now, it is, it's an exciting time for British strong men. Do you, when looking back on your career, are there, if you were to focus on a record, what would your record have been if you'd gone specifically for one? In my prime? Yeah. In my prime, I, I mean, I broke the Axel record at one stage. Uh, actually, I broke the deadlift record as well, but I, it was never a thing then. It was part of an event. It wasn't like um, just a one-off contest with prize money for, for that. Um, if... <laughs> I, I would always say my, my best event was, is, is yoke farmers and squatting. They were my three best events. But strongman squat was never about max weight. It was always about repetition. Yeah. And then behind that, I was a very good deadlifter up until the point of tearing my lat. Worst injury. And one of the worst injuries I've ever seen me. And it's, you know, after that, my confidence was really knocked when it came to deadlifting. Before that, I, I, I felt like I was on track for a thousand pound deadlift at the time. Um, I, I felt good. And, you know, that, that, was, that was a real number that I was chasing. I really believed I was capable of that thousand pounds. But after, after tearing my lat, it really sort of knocked the, that mental confidence. It was weird because it actually helped me become a better all-round strongman. I had to look at mistakes that I was making. Right. Um, and I also, back then, had no off button. It was literally, I will push and push and push on this event until I'm done. And often that caused me to burn out of a competition. Whereas, you know, I came back and won Europe's and I did the deadlift at Europe's. I pulled 420 and then right. I went for 440 and I got it off the floor and I was fighting it. And then this voice in my head was just like, just put it down. Whereas right. pre-injury, I would have kept fighting it. <laughs> but that might have caused me to burn out and then not have the energy to perform on. You know, I went on to break two world records that day on the yoke and or the car walk and the frame walk. Um, whereas before that I might have burnt out and not, not performed that well on them. So you look back and you think, well, maybe it was a good thing, but yeah, I, I would have loved the crack at the deadlift at, at that time. You, Cause what I think is mesmerizing is I'm the opposite of this. So I'm let's say gym. I was having this conversation with the wrestler, actually. I was saying in the, the gym versus in the ring are just night and day because wrestlers are catching bodies midair. 
you're having to bear so much weight. A lot of the time it's asymmetric. My body just doesn't bear weight. So when I was chatting to a guy from the SBS, I said, my biggest issue is that body weight wise, I back myself to do pretty well at most things. However, you put 60 pounds on my back and say, go for a 30 mile yomp. My body would just break down. It would, I've got small joints and so I'm explosive so I can jump and all the rest of it. But in terms of, you're the, if you like, in unbreakable. I'm Samuel L. Jackson, you're Bruce Willis. Oh, so oh no, no, no. I'm definitely Samuel L. Jackson these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're speaking. We're speaking like they do. Um, but that idea that, that you, the, the tendon strength you must have, mate, to be able to, and the size of your joints alone, like, you must just be, have you ever had it measured even? Well, it's one of those things I, I, I haven't had it like scientifically proven, but when you look at strong men, the biggest guys tend to get the least injuries. So you look at Thor, you look at Eddie, you look at Zadrunas, and I'm not saying they haven't had injuries, okay? They have, mm -hmm. but their bodies cope with the, the monstrous. There's smaller guys that are incredible, absolutely incredible. I mean, Kiliuszkowski is without question one of the most remarkable athletes I've ever seen. I love him. But yeah. I have a, a fear that he's starting to break. You right. know, he's, he's still mid to you know i think he's about 27 he's yeah. had a number of surgeries already his body has really been through the mill and he's not he doesn't have the frame like the, the wrist size of his adrenus the the hip size the joints and that's the only fear with like the smaller guys they don't tend to be able to cope as long as the the real monsters that's interesting because when i first saw kilishkovsky up close i thought you are the perfect killing machine he <laughs> He is like T1000, just, but then what's crazy is you look at his, say, like you say, his width, his body size, how can he lift the log that he lifts, for example? He's still a long guy. And you think, he's rapid. He's just, like you say, possibly his weakness is his weakness, if that makes sense, in that it's, I would, you know what, if, if it was him and Tom Stoltman in the final going head to head, I don't know who I'd want to win more. It, that would be incredible. It, it, it's, it's a real shame he's not going to be competing this year at Worlds because I mean, after Thor and, and Eddie and those kind of guys won their titles, he was the man everyone's talking about winning. And as it stands, you know, if he can't come back from these injuries, it's going to be tough because there's so many great youngsters on the, on the way up. But he, he is such a phenom. You know, I've, I've never seen a man be so good at so many events. We're not talking right. like one event. You know, you can list off event after. He's great at log lifting. He's incredible at the dumbbell press. He's incredible at yeah. moving events, yokes, farmer's walks, car walks, those type of events. He's just unbelievable. Truck pulling. He, he's just phenomenal. You know, the, the stones, stones to shoulders, <laughs> awkward events. You can just <laughs> rattle off events and you're like where's the weakness and even his weakness when you talk about a deadlift people say he's a weak deadlifter he's pulled 420 kilos right imagine that was your worst event <laughs> and you <can> <laughs> <push>. <laughs> yeah mate it's... yeah when you when you put it like that because even but again is it also his ambition i remember speaking to him this could have been giants live manchester and he just won an event and he won it convincingly. And I said, um, you must be delighted. Or where's that effect? And he said, no. He said, I, I, make, a, I make a silly mistake. That, that was the dumbbell. Because he that's the same day he broke your world record yep. in ca car carry. And I, so he then, after the, exactly that, you respond to me. Because after, <laughs> so after the dumbbell, I think it was maybe the third event in the car, I come off the back of that and I said, I'm not going to say you must be delighted. How are you feeling about that? And he says, now I'm delighted. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. Just I, a different level. And that, show, that shows that mentality again. You know, we spoke about earlier, just the, the different level that some people go to. There's, there's Marius Pudzianowski remind me of someone like that. I don't know, you know, he, he, he always wanted to better himself. Even if he was beating everyone else, he still wanted to do better than he'd done before. And you've got to respect that kind of mentality. You know, one thing I'll say about Marius is that there's kind of this, I, I guess, a sort of co slight condemnation of that era where it's, it wasn't as heavy, uh, the, the whole thing with um, IFSA 
um, and all that. But the one thing I will say for Marius, to me, he carried that sport. And by that, I don't mean any disrespect to anyone else competing at that time, but he always carried it by virtue of his physique. Because back when in the UK, when Strongman was on Bravo at one stage, it really hit the doldrums. And everyone that I knew that was talking about Strongman wasn't really talking about Strongman, they were talking about Marius. Because he was obviously an enormous human being, but vascular visible abs he looked he looked incredible and even the whole i think the term he said was polska siwa which means polish power i think that's what he used to say but the whole polish power thing i'm not polish and i was going polish power you know he was just <laughs> such a great ambassador for the sport he, he 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 definitely kept it going i mean before strongman got like really popular you know the last couple of years the two people people mentioned particularly in the UK, Jeff Capes yeah. and Marius Pujanowski. Uh, you know, if I told somebody the strongman, they're like, oh, Marius Pujanowski and, and Jeff Capes. They were the two names people oh. came up with. So, yeah, I, I'm, I, you know, he... I don't believe Marius is the greatest of all time. I, be, I, I certainly believe he's one of them. Right. Take that away from him. He's a five times winner and he beat who was in front of him. And that's, that's all you can do at the end of the day. But his two wins in 2002, and then particularly his win in 2003, mm -hmm. that was one of the most dominating performances ever at a World's Strongest Man. Yeah, it's naming the greatest is a, I think the bottom line is it's a personal choice of what you deem to be great. Because I was listening to this, these guys chat about um, greatest across all sports. And they started off and I thought, that's exactly what I should do, is they started by defining what is your understanding of great. And so one thing they spoke about was having a seminal moment. And so they were then talking about um, uh, Olga, Colbert, Olga Corbett and Nadia Komanech and Simone Biles in gymnastics. So we're talking about the perfect 10, if you like, versus Simone Biles that's changed the game in what she's done. But they said, well, if it's about a seminal moment, then we've got to move Simone Biles to one side. But then if we're saying, is it about, so in their case, is it, is it gold medals? Is it, do you have to then compare it to that era? Another thing they added to it was, did, did that person bring people from outside of the sport into the sport? And so when you start talking about that, it cut for me, it brings Marius back into the equation. If we're saying, who is the, who's the best strong man ever? To me, that's weirdly, that's different to who was the greatest. I know sure. it's, a, it's a slight nuance. No, it, it's absolutely true. And that, that's why, you know, you've got to have someone like um, Jean-Paul Sigmundson in that category. Because, you know, if you're talking about pure strength, he's not as strong as, as a number of guys. Mm -hmm. But for achievements, charisma, what he did to propel the sport. Yeah. He's one of the, the greatest of all time. And actually, I think if you, so not that this is a barometer here, but if you take sports personality of the year on BBC every year, if you took somebody like, he wouldn't have been there because he was Icelandic and this was the international award. But if you took a John Paul and placed him there, he wouldn't have been out of place. No. Because he was a brand, he was a name, he was an icon, still is an icon. But he, and so that's another thing as well, isn't, if you say Michael Phelps, how many medals has he won? I think, I, th I think the answer's like, tw I think it's like 28 and 21 a gold, it's something stupid. But there's a broad question about, does it matter that he perhaps isn't that recognizable? And again, it's up for the up for discussion. But all those things has checked because I personally have Big Z as who I consider to be the best ever strong man. Yes. For me, if you then ask it, if I change that question and I say, who on their best day would be the best? I've got a different answer because I think it's. Some people, Z has had longevity and he's done it against, he's had, he's had a few rivals over the years. And I think he's just a remarkable human being. But for me, when I say who is the best on their day, Eddie begins to enter the equation now for me. Like actually who would act, 
if you took them on, if it was 2017 Botswana with Eddie or whatever that one day was, the one day for Z, the one day, and I, I fluctuate between, it'd be Eddie, Shaw, Z, and I'd probably go Shaw. Shaw between a lot of them. Actually, I'd go Shaw as on his absolute best day. I so Brycey says, if there's one person you want to pull off a car, as it were, that's lying yeah. on you, who do you want it to be? And I, I, I understand what he's saying. Where I slightly beg to differ is I think, and Colin is to me, he's the oracle of strong man knowledge, but is that's one movement. And that's ultimately it's a deadlift slash tire flip, whatever you want to call it. Sure, I just you spoke about no weaknesses on his absolute best. I mean, he just like some kind of cyborg, just yeah, faultless. So yeah, I, who would you go in that scenario, by the way? We're talking one day, best one ever. Day. It, it's a very difficult argument. It, it really is, and and like you say, we'll all have different. Because I mean, I, I would take Eddie out of that. Okay. Because I don't think Eddie was good enough all round to be in the content. And Eddie was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And there's certain events, you know, Eddie was the best at. There's no question about that. And when he won in 2017, he deserved to win. And, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm friends with Thor. And I said to Thor, Eddie deserved to win. It was, you know, th that, that set of events, he was the best. But if we're talking, you can throw any event, you know, you put a, sh a load of events into a competition and we're talking absolute best, then I think it comes down to Brian, Zadrunas and Thor. So I'll chuck one extra caveat in. So I personally think the strongest man that's ever lived is Bill Kazmaier. And what I, what I mean by that is if, you, if we sent everyone back to the medieval times and you went, guys, you've got to train, who comes out on top? I think it's... Bill, because it's, it's tough to compare eras. It, and it's, it, it, it's such an interesting debate because if we're talking strongest ever, yeah. I, put, I put Eddie back into the contention. <laughs> it is interesting, isn't it, mate? Yeah. But, but it depends if we're talking strongest physically in terms of lifting weights yes. or best strongman. It, and yeah, that's, mate, that's yeah. the difference. Eddie and Bill, both of their timelines, those two guys were the strongest statically yeah. If, if you if you go to a gym and you're talking squatting, benching, deadlifting, overhead pressing, they're the kind of you know four big lifts that people do. And you take technique out of it. Yeah. You know, forget technique because there's some power lifters out there that are phenomenal, mm -hmm. but they're technically superb. If you're just talking brute strength, you know, you see guys in a gym just lifting. Eddie in his time is the strongest statically. Bill is the strongest in his timeline. The, the, but are they the best strong man, strong men, if you like, yes. in terms of, of actual strength athletes uh, yes. when you're talking about the sport? That's a different question for, for me. So I would add one per so I entirely agree with the whole with who's the strongest ever. I'd add Mark Henry to the equation there. That would be a great that, that would be awesome. I mean, Mark, obviously you know Mark well from from working with the, the WWE. Um uh, he's someone I'd love to talk to and, 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 you know, just pick his brain because he's someone that could have focused on strongman and right. obviously won the Arnolds. I think there was, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Vince McMahon tell him if he, he can do it, but he has to win. Yeah. And if he doesn't win, he's not welcome back. You know, it's, it, and also at that time as well, for, I think he um, trained for eight weeks specifically for the events and throughout that time, his mother was sadly on her deathbed. And so he was going from the gym to the hospital, back to the gym. Jeez. And you think, like, if anyone who's lost someone close to them, just what that takes out of you, going through that trauma. I mean, you're knackered anyway, before you've lifted a weight. And so even that, to me, cause, uh, like with anything, the more you get, you delve into something, the more you find out. So how much access did he have to, um, for example, the Apollo's wheel, et cetera. To me, regardless, he won. But yeah, that as a as a trio, Eddie, um, who do we say, Bill, Bill. Uh, and Mark? My goodness, mate. That okay? That, so that, that's, a, just... that's a that's a, a front row in a in a rugby team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone's getting killed that day. <laughs> anyway, if I were to change it, then and I were to go, so we take all the the best 
who you deem to be the best strongman on their day. You're not told the event, which is crucial. It's the 2022 World Strongest Man. Somehow they brought them at their peak. You're only allowed to look at the results. Who's going to come one, two, three? Who do you predict? Because you have to, to me, you then add to the equation of who the, who's the best competitor. I have to, I would definitely have Brian Shaw in that list. I think Brian, you can chuck any event at him. If we're talking prime Brian at yeah. his absolute best, Brian has a legitimate claim to be called the best strong man of all time. So Drunas in his prime, for me, he's the best of all time. You know, that's, that's my personal opinion. And I've got no issue with someone saying someone else's, but that's just my opinion. And I do believe while... Well, I think if Thor kept going, I honestly believe Thor could have been the best of all time. The fact is he retired, he's got his fight with, with Eddie and he hasn't done enough to go into that category. But I believe there was no weakness at the time he retired. You know, he, he's pretty much, you can throw any event at him and he's going to do well. There's, there's no weakness. So I, I would put those three, but that's, and if you ask maybe, say, Colin Bryce, Colin would probably say, you know, a Jean-Paul Sigmundson, because I think we've all got different timelines that we grow up with and, and we've got our favourites. I know, you know, certain people will always pick Jeff, um, Jean-Paul Sigmundson and Bill Kazmaier. There's always people that will pick, you know, Marius Pudjanowski. And I, I've competed against a number of these athletes. I've competed against Brian. I've competed against Thor. I've competed against Eddie. I've competed against Zadrunas. And I can go, I can only go on my experience, but if we're talking the best ever, if, if I was going to a comp and I, 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 you know, they were in the best shape, not knowing the events, I'd say it'd be a toss between Brian and Thor. Interesting. Yeah. Cause the one thing about Thor, which for me doesn't get spoken about enough is a, I think I might say this, I might be wrong here. The only other person to podium on their first ever world, I think it's Maggie there. I don't think Thor po uh, podiumed at his first world. Well, did he final? Uh, I beat Thor in his first world. <laughs> oh, fair play. What year was that? That was 2011. So I think he was seventh or eighth, but he made the, he made the final. But um, yeah, Maggie obviously won. Yeah. Uh, Yuko Ahala also won. His, his Thank first. you. I didn't, I didn't remember that. Yuko, that's silly. That is for a guy as small as he was comparatively to go from powerlifting to that. Thank you for that correction. So, how many times has Thor been on the podium? I think like seven. Because I thought it was every, in my head, I obviously got it wrong. It was every year until he retired, but it obviously wasn't the first one then. No, the first one, he, he still made the final, didn't make um, the podium. But yeah, I mean, I think it was six times on the podium before he won. So, it was 11. Was that, was that Brian Z and then Terry? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that and then you, were you I fourth was, that year? I was fourth. That, that had a, that, the 2011 final was a hell of a lineup. Right. But to think Britain three and four, that's flipping cool. Yeah. It was, it was, we've had some good results the last couple of years. It's, um, and it's getting better. I mean, you know, we've got, well, there's seven British guys going to Worlds this year, five of which have a legitimate shot of making the final. In my, in my eyes. Who, who's a podium for you? Any of, the, any of those guys? The British guys? Yeah. I think Tom Stoltman has a great chance. Yeah. Great chance. I think the other guys have a chance, but I wouldn't put them as favourites. I would put Tom... If, if Again, it, and, you know, people are bored of me saying this. It'll come down to events. But um, <laughs> I, think, I think Tom has the best chance of a legitimate win at World's Strongest Man out of all of them currently. I think Hicksie with the right set of events is extremely dangerous, but also with the wrong set of events, he, he, you know, he can do not so well. And I put Luke into that same category. Luke Stoltman, I think is the same. I think Luke Richardson still needs another year or two, but he's going to be a legitimate contender. He's just getting stronger and stronger. I think people, I think people think I don't like Luke, which is totally wrong. He's just still quite green when it comes to strongman he hasn't done that many competitions and that's not me criticizing him i just think he needs another year or two to really become a genuine threat to say challenge like a novakov or uh kiliushkovsky 
I tell you what, if you if you do if you are currently competing in strongman and you give him a year or two, <laughs> flipping heck, good luck because he the it's like that is curve. It's just been phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And you know, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm looking forward to the battle uh, for the British title this year because that's that's a harder one to pick than than worlds. And, and people are, you know, people say, well, why are you putting Tom as the favorite at worlds? Tom has more weapons than anyone else. He's got certain events. I've explained this before with my, you know, my competing. If you put me into a contest with, say, a yoke and a frame and stuff like that, I, I can beat anyone in the world at those events. And Tom has events that he can beat anyone in the world at, so, such as the Atlas Stones. Mm -hmm. The other guys have less weapons. They're still extremely good athletes. But when you bring it down to the, like, the British level... Those strengths that Tom have, say Tom's so good at stones, he can get a few places between him and the other British guys. Whereas at Brits, he'll only get one place above the next British guy. So that's why the British is a bit harder to predict because they're, they're all so close anyway. You have less really good guys that can then start separating points. And actually, if you, if you said to me, if you could be the best at one event, it's going to be stones. And to have that in your locker, especially with the current format, because not that he'll be looking to do this, I know he won't be, but let's just say for whatever reason in the heat, if he underperforms, he knows that when it comes to the stone off, he goes through. So the bottom line really, if he goes first, he goes through automatically, or if he comes second or third, he basically goes through automatically because he's going to win on stones. Well, you look how ridiculous his group was last year. You had himself and Novikov in the same group. It, what would have happened if Novikov came second in that group? Right. Right, mate. Because, yeah. Because, you know, you had some great stone lifters in that group. I'm not saying he wouldn't have got through, but you had the number one and number two in the same group. With that system, if you suddenly get a really good stone lifter in there that could suddenly knock out like a Trey Mitchell, who's a great stone lifter, you know, it, it could. It, that, that's my issue with that setup at the moment. It's, it's putting so much stress, so much pressure on one event. And it's, you know, imagine if Eddie Hall could always have the banker of a deadlift as, as his last, you know, event. Or, or I could always have a yoke or Terry Hollands could always have a truck pull. Suddenly that's a big advantage to, to if, if you're really good at a certain event. And obviously Tom, right now, I don't think you can argue he's the best stone lifter on the planet. Yeah, he is. And, but another factor with Tom and I hope this doesn't happen in every sense. But if Luke doesn't final, Tom's chances for me of doing better improve again. Because he's ultimately got his confidant, his best mate, his family, or they're with him 100%. And that for me was, if you like, of massive benefit this year when there were no crowds, A, but B, you couldn't have a coach, a training partner, and just someone to get you in that frame of mind before you're about to go. And every time Tom moved in the final, you could just hear, I mean, I think Luke's got the deepest voice known to man. <laughs> and you could just hear his unbelievable tone just bellowing in that, when it was in, in the indoor kind of, go on, big Tommy! And it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the support he has for, for Tom. I mean, it, it's, it's quite endearing to watch. I think it sort of draws you in and it's why they're so likable. They're, 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 they're great lads, both of them. And, you know, I really hope Tom does go on to win Worlds because I think it would mean so much for the family. Uh, their, their dedication is mm -hmm. incredible. I mean, all the athletes, I hate saying that because all the athletes are dedicated. Every single one that goes to Worlds, they're, they're all incredible, unbelievable athletes. But obviously there's that story with those two and it, it would be great to see. And I, th I think it will happen. I do. Maybe not this year, but in the next couple of years, he, he's going to have some amazing opportunities. Yeah. It's also, my mum's from Dundee in Scotland. And I'll tell you what, you know, I love Scotland. I spent most of my school holidays there. What that will mean for Scotland is immeasurable. To so yeah. potentially have the world's strongest man in the Highlands of Scotland and also in Invergordon, you know, if you said where in Scotland is so-and-so from, invariably it's Glasgow. If not, it's Edinburgh. Yeah. In Where's in Vergordon? And they are putting that place on the map. And just from, um, if you like, a strongman uh, pool standpoint, the amount of talent that's going to be heading that way. And just 
guys training hard, if they don't even go into strongman per se, they could be a legacy where 15 years from now, you have guys who compete in shot put or hammer or powerlifting or even strongman who basically were just blokes who saw the two largest human beings they'd ever seen in their life training locally. They drove the 10 miles, started training themselves. And then, you know, there could be a real Scottish legacy. And so those boys are really... I really respect them and what they've done, the sacrifice Luke's made, left a lucrative job in the, on the oil rig to go and pursue his dream with his brother. And you think, oh, that is that is Netflix stuff right there. It is. It, it really is. They're, they're, they're great guys. They're getting better. And, and like you said, it's just such a an inspiring story. And I think we've already seen that improvement in Scotland, particularly the strongman, because right. there was a time when say when myself terry mark was sort of dominating the, the british scene they would send a couple of scottish guys to like a britain strongest man and you wouldn't even you wouldn't even look at them there was there was no threat whereas now even the guys behind the stoltmans are very good athletes they've got some really good up and coming scottish athletes and, and and it's thanks to those boys just raising that standard and, and putting them on the map well zaki's one of those guys um, and it'll be lovely to see him him progress but i mean bish I, I went to Bish's first ever strongman event and it was on a farm in Leicestershire. Then, and I remember he was under 105 at that point. He was a very fast, or well, very fast for a rugby player. And he was a great guy. And he just said to me in passing, oh, I'm going to do my first ever strongman event. I'm like, I'll go and watch that. And so um, me and my girlfriend at the time, we went off and watched him. He just pulled 300 kilos off the floor in the power base gym, which made him the man. The man. The power base gym. <laughs> and mate, it, there's no footage on camera, but I'll tell you what, how his back didn't break is beyond me. But <laughs> to see him go from 300, where he was on the limit to pulling a thousand pounds, you think, mate, you are just, and his second strong man event was in a car park in Leicester. What, if you dropped a bomb on that place, the amount of bouncers in Leicester that night would have gone down about 50%. There was one guy having apple crumble as his intra workout. You know, it was properly <laughs> old school. And to see, I mean, that was 2011 or go. And just 10 years on, he's finaling in worlds. And for me, it's a legitimate danger to getting on the podium. I think it's, rem but to be fair, without the you and the Terry's and the Marks, who knows if that would be the case, because they see you, you're the guys who make them think there's, it's possible. There's, there's always that knock-on effect. I remember when I got into sport, it was actually Terry, Ollie Thompson and Felix that, that um, you know, I looked up to. Uh, so it's, it's always good to know that people have been inspired by what you do. And, and you know, th those guys have taken on the mantle now. They, they are the best guys in the country. You've you got guys like myself and, and Terry and Felix that can still on our day, and I'll go and say it again with the right set of events, we can still hold our own, but we're not as good as those, those or we're not consistently as good as those guys now. And I might upset Terry and, and Felix by saying that, but it's fact that, you know, the Stoltman brothers, Bish, um, Graham Hicks and Luke Richardson, for me, they are the top five British guys right now. And the guys that have a chance of, of, you know, getting onto the podium at Worlds and, and potentially, hopefully winning. They're, they're the guys I see that we've got to kind of push now to, to do these big shows. I, I hate to say this, but the, obviously the year you got injured at Worlds, I legitimately thought you'd podium that year because the events, I thought oh, that could be, because you, often you mentioned the events, it, was, it wasn't tailor-made for you, but it was a good set of events. And... It was such, I was, I was gutted for you for so many reasons. You don't like to see anyone you're fond of get hurt, obviously. But I thought, oh man. Because, and, and that was obviously around the time when you were doing silly stuff at Wuss and deciding that half a time wasn't gonna crush your spine and just run with it. But yeah, I really felt like that was, it's part, it's part and parcel of sport, I guess, but yeah, I really felt that that could have been yourself. So whilst you're saying there are other guys now, 24 months ago, that wasn't the case. And that's not that many months, really. No, it's not, I guess. But um, that's, it's part of life. And I'm not, I'm not sitting here being negative. I, I'm going to train hard for the Royal Albert Hall. It's just, and it's not even my age. I kind of jokingly say I'm old and stuff like that. It's not the age, it's the mileage that I've put my body through. 
my, my body's been through a lot. It's suffered, you know, one too many injuries. And I can, as long as I'm smart, you know, I, I'm being really smart with my build up to this show. I'm, I'm sort of focusing on what I need to focus on. Okay. Whereas, whereas if I was going to Worlds, I'd be focusing on everything. That's what when it becomes harder to try right. and make sure you're in shape to squat massive weights, to, to move fast, to press massive weights, you know, to pull trucks, to, to lift Atlas stones and, and, you know, be ready at the drop of a hat to, to go to, you know, these, these big shows. That's what's harder. I've got 15 weeks to build up to one show. That's a little bit easier. And it's only five events. Whereas if I was training for worlds, you're training for potentially 12 events, maybe more, especially if the guys don't know exactly what they're doing. So it's that that's much harder. So like with just five events to train for, then I already know the events and knowing Darren, he won't change them. He's very good. Once he sets events, he, he'll stick with them. So I've got five events that I need to prepare for. That means I can back off squatting. You know, I can just focus on my deadlift. I can focus on the frame, the stones, the, the overhead, and I don't need to worry about training for anything else. Uh, you know, I train the muscles, but strongman events are very brutal. And how's, how's it been training at a lighter body weight? Well, I'm still pretty heavy. It's not like I'm light, but I, I've lost 20 kilos on my biggest. And right. I feel I feel so much better. I do. <laughs> I feel so much better. You know, at my biggest, I was 170 kilos, which right. I'm, I'm not meant to be 170 kilos. You know, I'm, uh, I, I'm sort of, I'm 147 now and I feel good. I feel fit. You say you're not meant to be 170. I mean, I remember, you actually won't remember this because I said it from afar. I was working at the BBC and you just come from doing BBC breakfast. Yeah. And you were walking from what's called Key House to the car park. And I looked over and I thought, that guy looks just like Lawrence Charlotte. And I thought, but he can't because he's too big. <laughs> and I thought, that's Lawrence Charlotte. And so I basically <laughs> shouted from, from afar. But when I first met you, mate, I could not believe how big you were. It was and even just like you can you can tell a lot by somebody from the thickness of their joints the width of their scapula hip size and on all three of those you're off the charts mate so it kind of doesn't surprise me that you won you were 170 yeah well, I, feel, I feel better bringing my weight down I, to be honest i want to bring my weight down even more i'll okay. probably i'll probably stay around this weight while I'm training for this contest but then after that i want to bring my weight down again you know i'm getting towards 40 i don't want to be 150 kilos and I've got other things now I'm very busy with, with different things going on I've got my family to think about I think you have to get to a point in your life where you decide I need to put other things first and okay. that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at and I, I feel good at 147 like I am now but I think ideally I want to get down to about 130 I'm never going to be <gasps> tiny <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still going to be pretty strong at 130 but I'm not going to be a threat to the best guys in the world. Well, so, mate, I'm saying 130. Like you're saying, I'm not going to be tight. That's still 60 kilos heavier than I am now. So <laughs> and that, that's the problem when you talk to strong men. We just throw around these numbers, but they're three digit numbers rather than two digit numbers like the normal people would. <laughs> well, the irony, mate, is I was speaking to Andy Shepard after he came back from Wuss, and he said that when you guys were chatting about how much body weight you are, you speak in two digits, you just miss off the one. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that is hilarious. And I'm like, you know the irony, Andy, is that I could do two digits, and for a few of them, I'd still be lighter than their three digits <laughs> minus the first one. It's crazy. Well, if you think when, when I first got into Strongman, the biggest guys were what I am now. Right. You know, like Hugo, Hugo Girard, for instance, he was massive when I got into Strongman. He was 150 kilos. It was just... You know, guys like Terry came along, Brian Shaw, you know, they took it up to another level. And then you got Zdrunas got up to like 190. Eddie got up to 190. Uh, Thor and, um, and Brian went over 200 kilos. You know, you got Gav Bilton now, 210 kilos. It's getting scary. What about, how big was Mike Jenkins? Mike was a big guy. He was up at 180. He, okay. he was a massive guy. And, you know, God bless him. He, he would have won world's strongest man, that guy. He was unbelievable. I remember meeting Terry for the first time at Body Power Expo 2009 and he was sat behind, he was the only person, sponsored athlete, I can't even think what the company was, it might have been my protein, but he was sat behind this desk, everyone else was stood up and I remember thinking, he's a big guy and then somebody asked him if he could get a photo, he went, yeah sure no problem, 
it took him about half an hour to stand up. He was that tall. And he was so <laughs> big. I remember sort of eclipsing all the lights. And me and my mate just looked at each other. It's what on earth? And that's a guy who's six six. And then a couple of years later at Body Power Expo, I met Brian. And it's you you sit in a what was really special about that is you were seeing bodybuilders. So you were seeing Phil Heath, who at the time was not the Phil Heath that we know him to be now. There were guys like um uh who else was there? Tony Freeman, there was Rolly Winkler, um, there were a few guys there, Branch Warren. But they're around five, somewhere between five, seven and five, ten, depending. And then Brian Shaw walked down the corridor and we, me and my mate said hello to him. And he was just, he was so gentle and so nice. And so he said, lovely to meet you. How are you? But you're, it's almost, it sounds like an insult. It's not at all. It's almost like being in a zoo. <laughs> suddenly you go, look at that. Look at, and it's, it's just a Bongus. When it says giants live, it's that for a reason because the vast majority of them are giants and then some. It's quite funny. I, I've been in many situations where I've been out with a bunch of strong men. Uh, I've had night, like nights out with Terry and Brian Shaw before, and sort of I'll walk in first and people look and they're like, bloody hell, look at the size of him. And then Terry comes in and then, you know, Brian comes in <laughs> and people's eyes, they're just like, <laughs> or the, the best one is on an aeroplane. You, you get onto the aeroplane and, you know, I'll sit next to someone and you can see how disappointed they are. That, <laughs> and I'll sort of nudge them. I'll be like, you'll be happy in a minute. And then suddenly you get like a, a Zadrunus or, or a Thor or, or Eddie come along, you know, that just block out the sun. And they're like, Jesus, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it is funny when you see, especially a group of strong men together. I'm sure it's the same with the wrestlers. Yeah, it's, I guess the reason they're slightly lighter is they've just got to be so mobile. Um, and then also in terms of some of them do aerials. Um, and then on top of that, the engine you've got to have to go for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You just, I mean, uh, Braun Strowman, obviously former strongman. And I asked Colin, actually, I said, how good do you think he could have been? And he just said, flat out, could have been world's strongest man. Yeah. He said, he had all the tools, mate. He said, um, there are lots of people with all the tools, lots of people. There are a number of people with all the tools who injury, decide not to go for it, in his case, has an amazing opportunity to go off. But one thing that Bryce said, and it kind of stuck with me, was he said, I think when you are a man of a certain capacity, and by that strength, size, speed, whatever, he said, if you don't find out, you will always have that question. He went, you could become the world's richest man, but if you have that capacity, you'll always wonder, I wonder how strong I could have been yeah. and he went and you don't really start asking that question he went until you realize that you're never going to break your personal best yeah and bryce he's really honest about that kind of stuff he'll happily talk about the fact that he was an olympian 2002 salt lake city bobsleigh so a strong guy competing in world's strongest man as a, a as a reserve but so a, a strong human being and he said i remember going to a gym and just realizing I'm only maintaining at best now. And he went, tough to take, it tough is. to take. And he went, enjoy it while you can. It doesn't really matter, Colin, because my best bench isn't going to make anyone go, oh, wow. You'll go, oh, okay. But that's as good as it's going to, so I'm never going to have it quite in the same, because even with, you, with yourself, if you get down to 130, 120 even, would you feel, would it change how you feel about if you're used to people looking at you and noticing you and thinking, bloody hell, you're the alpha? When I originally retired, when I, when I got my, my, tore my Achilles and I was like, I'm done. It was very, very hard mentally because I've always been known as big laws, the strong man. It wasn't until I decided to commit a hundred percent into the other things that I've been doing now. So I've got a couple of businesses that I'm focused on. I've got my YouTube page, which I'm focused on. Um, got into like the commentating side of things that it's given me a different purpose. So now I think I don't, I, I've had my time and I, you know, I'm still training hard for this one last show, but I don't feel that pressure that I felt then. But yeah, when I first retired and I was injured on the sofa, like, you know, I felt useless. I felt absolutely useless to be quite honest with you. Felt, I felt like I'd let everyone down and I felt like I was pathetic, which is, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's a hard thing to go through at the time. 
Um, and I really had to sort of change what, uh, what I, how I saw myself more importantly than, than how other people saw me. And I've seen, I've been lucky enough to talk to so many greats from the past now. And one thing I, I sort of admire is the, the people that have been able to, you know, change and, and move into different things. Cause there's some that haven't been able to, and, and they're, they're in a bad place now. And I, you know, it opened up my eyes that as much as I love this sport and as much as I love being, you know, one of the best strong men on the planet, it made me realize there's still other things that I can do. And that, that, that was important. I think if you don't have something to focus on and move into, then it's very difficult. Did you ever get therapy? No, uh, I'm not really. Uh, this is just my personal choice. I'm not really, I, I don't believe it will help me. I'm a, I'm a stubborn, you know, <laughs> male, if you like, in that, oh. that department. I, I'm like, um, a bit like Tyson Fury, I guess. I need to keep busy. If I'm mm. not busy, then I sit around and get depressed and get miserable. So now I just be, I've just become a workaholic. You know, I work 18 hours a day, <laughs> most days. Um, but I'm happier doing that because I don't have time to sit and feel sorry for myself. It's just yeah. having that structure that I know right in the morning, I'm going to get up, I'm going to do this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'll go train, I'll work. It, it just keeps me in a much better mental state. And, so, and that works well for me. So the, re the reason I asked, so I lost my dad in 2017 and I basically I buried it. I just decided, no, I'm going to plow on. And I, looking back at my calendar from a presenting standpoint, I was probably working um in a month it wasn't that unusual to see i've got two days off and and that could be you're on literally i'm on the road for 29 of the 31 days and i reached a point where i could feel my, my dad never used to have a temper he's never ever lost his temper over anything he was just he's really stoic and could tolerate unbelievable amounts of pain as well i mean we had a, a tooth extracted and they said basically, would you like to have an injection? But it was worded as, where would you like the injection type thing? As in, it's going to happen, obviously. He said, no, 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 no medication. And I was about five. And I remember seeing this dentist with his hand on the bed, pulling this tooth out. And my dad, as a, one of the back ones, and my dad went once, oh, uh, that was it. He just, <laughs> just as hard as nails. And, um, and anyway, so when he, when he passed, I realized that I was just, I was just burying everything and distracting myself. And I, and so when I, and I knew that because I was beginning to lose, I could feel my temper boiling. I was having to almost measure myself and check myself. I never actually lost my temper, but I could feel it. And I thought I need to speak to somebody about this. And much like yourself, I just didn't really cry, not a crier really traditionally. I, you know, I could, up until that point, I could have listed you over 10 years, about three times I'd cried and, you know, but it was just the best thing that I, that I did. And I see the therapist sort of every couple of months now. Um, and yeah, and it's, and it's because it forced me to look inward. And that's the hardest thing to do, to actually be honest and introspectively just say, I'm good. So we hear a lot now. It, men should speak more, men should talk more. Yeah. Now, my mum's worked in mental health for 45 years. I don't believe men should talk more. I believe men should talk more in the right place because talking to my mate might work or it might not work. It could be dangerous. Sure. In the same way, saying to a fat person, go to the gym. Well, do the wrong exercises in the wrong sequence at the wrong time, at the wrong weight, you're gonna hurt yourself potentially. Yeah. And it may make you put on even more weight. So to me, Speaking is, is a part of it. It's a necessary but not sufficient requirement. So speaking to somebody that knows how to deal with what you're going through, that to me is the key. Mm. And the first session I had, I was basically, I was closed. And I didn't realize the next session, I got in there and within 15 seconds, I just burst into tears. And I realized I was holding it all back, holding it all back. And I realized I could just let myself go. And it was, I, I addressed so much and it was about, so now, um, Brad, this job's come in. Do you want to do it? Before, they wouldn't have to even finish the sentence. Yep. Because it was distraction. Yeah. And yeah, and actually now I just go, um, do you know what? I think I'll leave that actually. Which is, and that's a real mindset change for me now. A mm. real mindset change. And so, yeah, so I just boring you with that story yeah, there. It's, 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 it's really interesting. I, I, I've probably got tons of things deep down that I, I do need to talk about but 
right now I, I feel in a good place. I, I've I've openly spoken before that I, I've suffered with depression and things like that, and um, I think a lot of us have. I think it's it's not an you know it's not an uncommon thing. Sometimes people think they're the only one. I think that, and as a strong man, it's hard to admit that you've got things like that. You know, you do, you, you feel like you're the big strong man in the family. You've, you should be, you know, should be big, tough, be able to cope with things. And sometimes there's been moments where I'm this big exterior frame and there's this cray little, you know, boy inside there that's, that's breaking. But um, I've managed to get myself into a good mental state and it, it wasn't easy. I'm very lucky that I've got Liz, who's just the most supportive, you know, person I've ever met, to be honest. And she is naturally a positive person. I, I, and I need that in terms of a relationship. I've been in the past, you know, my ex, you know, lovely lady, but very, very negative. And, and that would kind of rub off on me. Whereas Liz is very positive and that, that helps. And, and she's, she knows if I get injured or anything like that, she'll give me a day of sulking. <laughs> and then she's like, right, you need to kick yourself up the backside and get focused. Uh, and that's helped me so much. It's changed my mentality a lot over the years. Uh, I'd say before I met her, I was a, ne a, a very negative person myself, whereas now I try and be as positive as possible. I'm not a saint. There's always days where you just feel down and, and it can be for no reason sometimes. But I try to to do something productive every day to, to make sure I'm, I'm moving forwards and then just being as, as effective and as, as positive as I can be. I'm not a machine. There's always days where you feel I can't be asked today, <laughs> you know, yeah. she'll give me a kick up my ass and make me do something. And then, you know, you start the day productively and you can, end, you can end it, you know, being great. Whereas in the past, I might've stayed in my bed, covered myself under the, the duvet and been miserable all day. And then you feel worse because you get into that down, downward spiral. So. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really interesting, because I think part of the, the, if you like, the cycle of sport is we only care about when that person is relevant. And you mentioned, obviously, some greats in the past is that well, what happens, A, if you are close but no cigar in strongman? What happens if you got there and it still wasn't enough? What happens if you don't even have a chance to be close but no cigar? What's the best of those scenarios? What hurts the least on the other side? And, you know, I find Thor really interesting for that because he, prior to his kind of 501, he lost so much weight. And I guess it might help that you're six foot nine, six foot ten or whatever, but it's how do you feel when you're not you know, biblically strong? Do you feel less of a man? Do you feel, how do you define yourself in that? Because even, you know, a mate of mine said, he said, uh, he said it was really humbling. He said, because I was the strongest guy in my gym. He went, the problem was, I thought that applied to the rest of the country. <laughs> he said, it wasn't until I went to a really good gym and he went, and of the 20 or so serious lifters, he went, I was probably 18th. And he went, he said, he said, do you know what that does to you? He said, from about 16 onwards, I, I won't even say his name in case he's listening. He said, I was the, that guy. You know, have you seen X do this? I was that guy. He said, and then I thought, I'm going to go to an even better gym. These guys can't keep up with me. And he said, and then I went, oh. And, he, and his example was, he said, it was like climbing a mountain only to realize that where the clouds stop isn't where another mountain joins. And you know, I went, Oh no. And I think that happens on a, on a big scale for a lot of people. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, th I think, and I see this from, cause I, I do so much coaching now. I coach a number of athletes uh, from beginners to elite level, you know, world strongest man athletes. Um, a lot of people are very insecure and they put so much pressure on themselves. And, and, and also one, one of the biggest issues with strongman and strength in general is people think anyone can do it right which is amazes me because not anyone can be a pro football player anyone can play football anyone can go to the gym and lift but not anyone can take a free kick like david beckham you know right and not anyone is going to lift like eddie hall and the problem is people think with strongman well, if I get the best coach, the best nutritionist, do this, that, and the other, train like this, then, well, just, you know, let's say 
I'm going to do Zadrunas' shoulder routine. And they were like, I'm going to break the log lift record. Doesn't work like that. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you could give me, you could, you could get Nadal coaching me at tennis for 10 years. I'm still never going to be <laughs> um, uh, an open tennis champion, Wim Wimbledon champion or whatever. And it, rather than focusing on just bettering yourself, I think too many of us are comparing ourselves to everyone else. And with social media now where we can literally flick through on our phones and see a hundred of the best lifters on the planet, suddenly you feel quite insignificant and, and quite weak. But in reality, these guys and girls are still incredibly strong athletes. And, you know, if they went to most local gyms, they're going to be stronger than, than most people in there. But I think because we can see so many, you know, ridiculous lifters at the, the drop of a button, it puts that that mental kind of state, oh, I'm no good. The amount of people, I, I, I know 180 kilo log lifters, 180 kilos, he's like, oh, I'm rubbish. <laughs> right. But you know, I think rubbish. My, my, one of my mentors, Brian, talks about living either inside out or outside in. And when you're, when you're, if you like, looking at other people to determine how you feel about yourself, you're living outside in. And we all do it to a greater or lesser extent. Sure. But living inside out means, here we go, my personal best is on the bar today. If I get it, I'll feel brilliant because that's the best I've ever done. Yeah. And the guy after me could warm up on that, but that, that's, that's not why I feel good. And I think, you know, it's society teaches us to even measure how much we're gonna live outside in. Oh, hang on, this photo, I, I won't say who, but I was, having dinner with an influencer, a, a YouTuber. And I remember him saying to me, so he actually looked low. I said, you all right, mate? And he, oh, no, I just put a photo out and it tanked. I, I said, what does that mean? And he, he only got 55,000 likes. <laughs> I thought, wow, okay. I, so, but and a number of thoughts went through my head. Number one is, I can't really think of many people who get that amount of likes anyway, followers, let alone that. Yeah. Two, that it would has a that much of a direct effect on you. Mm. And I thought, hmm, that that is really interesting. And that that for me was a little bit of an alarm bell because it's always nice when you get more likes. It literally means more people like it. Therefore, more people like you. Therefore, more people, you're important, you're great, you're and you do that all the and yeah, it's it is a little bit of a dangerous game. And I think somebody like Maggie there, you know, one person that says we haven't spoken about is Maggie there, is that four times world's strongest man. And if you didn't know that, you would never find out from him. No. Just so comfortable in his own skin. So just, yeah, that's what I did. As, as though he went down the park, he played Wolverhampton Rovers uh, under 17 team, beat them, came back up. He said, Maggie, what are you talking about? I love Maggie as well. He's just Legend. just a cool guy. He's he's brilliant. He, but yeah, you're you're absolutely right. It's it's just the society that we live in, I guess now. It's, but what about yourself, mate? Because what what do you think you'll do broadcasting? Because I I remember when um, I think it wasn't your Achilles. I for whatever reason I think you you were injured on in a particular event, and I was asking you about somebody who's doing going for a log press attempt. And I said, you went immediately. So they hadn't even stood up, he's missed it. I'm like, why? And then you spoke about how long it had taken him to do it. And I thought, wow, this guy, you could, a lot of, well, a number of people can see stuff. A number of people can communicate stuff. Not that many people have both together. And I think I said to you, I think you should go in to say, something like rugby commentary, but or punditry, but specifically from a kind of strength standpoint. And to me, like, you're crying out to be doing something like that, whether it is comedy, because your commentary, mate, is it's awesome. And it's so much out of watching watching your stuff. It really is it's great. And even someone like Andy, Andy is, that's what he does. But having you beside him is was the game changer. That was the difference maker. I think hopefully with the, the way Strongman's going forward there's going to be a lot more opportunities like that i've actually had a couple of opportunities come my way so there's some arm wrestling opportunities coming up Wicked. and a few other things so yeah it's, is that it's, the larry wheels one 
I can't say much yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, mate, that's awesome. But, um, yeah, there's there's a few opportunities coming up, so it's it's all good, and um, hopefully I can I can keep going with it. But um, like yourself, I mean, you're you're someone that is diverse into everything, and you know you, you've done so many brilliant things. Uh, I'm going to have to let you go because you've been here. I've probably taken up way too much of your time already. But I want to say pleasure. thank you so much. I, I could chat to you all night. I really could. Uh, Radzi, thank you very much. Just um, before you go, where can people find you? Because I know you've got your, um, what is the um, Making Gains? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I'm doing Making Gains podcast. That's on YouTube. Just search Making Gains. And everyone from, at the moment, it's been Mark Henry, a couple of wrestlers, a couple of athletes, um, uh, to SBS guy. And then also on Instagram, it's just I am Radzi. Brilliant, buddy. It's been an absolute pleasure. Guys, make sure you go and follow Radzi on Instagram. Go and check out his podcast. And Radzi, again, thank you for coming on, my friend. Thank you, Lars. While you're here, guys, subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my awesome strength content.